and start the presentation. So the, the, the reason that we're all here today is to talk about sales, especially sales around education games. Uh, and I have to say that in my, I don't know, just about 20 years in the education marketplace. And I think that uh, Glenn and Randy will, would agree with me. You know, sales is really the, the single greatest challenge in the education market. Uh, it's not having, whereas it's important to have a great product, it's important to teach. Um, there are a lot of great products in education, but the thing that always seems to trip us up is getting the distribution out there. And, the, and there really aren't any easy solutions. Uh, we've talked to a number of you, or you know, a lot of you know, know me personally, um, about the problems that you all have had in selling an education and, and kind of traded war stories. And so we, th we think that we've put together something that could be a, a viable solution, especially around education games. Um, there's going to be three of us here conducting this call. Um, me, <laughs> I'm Mitch Weisberg, uh, Glenn McCandless, and Randy Jennings. And I think what we'll do is we'll have each one of us introduce ourselves, and we'll start off with me. And our contact information is, is up here on the slide as well. Um, I'm Mitch Weisberg. Uh, I founded Academic Business Advisors around 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, we advise ed tech companies on, on strategy, positioning, and distribution. Um, and you know some of the companies that we've advised include uh, School Improvement, Net Improvement Network, where over a four or five year period, uh, they grew from just over a startup to around uh, $30 million. Uh, Symbolu, which many of you have heard of, which entered the education marketplace from Europe around five or six years ago. Um, U-Certify is, is another company that has, that has grown tremendously over the last uh, five or six years that we've been advising. Uh, basically, we work with companies to determine you know, what their sweet spot is in education and how to expand rapidly. In addition, um, many of you are familiar. Uh, if, if you have um, so somebody's uh, 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 speaker microphone is on, and we can hear air a lot, maybe um, mute your microphone if, if you're not talking. Uh, many of you uh, have heard about Games for Ed, which is the not profit that I helped start about three or four years ago. Um, the goal of Games for Ed is to increase the use of game-based learning in education. And we work with uh, developers, education, educators, researchers, administrators. And we have a tweet chat at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time on Thursdays. Uh, I was a co-chair of the education division of the SIA over the last year or so. Um, and I run an organization called EdChat Interactive, which allows educators to share best practices. Um, so that's me. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Glenn. Do you want to introduce yourself? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Mitch. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're talking from or listening from. I uh, appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to be here with my two colleagues, uh, Mitch Weisberg and Randy Jennings. Uh, I've been in the ed tech sector uh, for, seems like, most of my life, uh, actually going on about 30 years. I uh, started off at Apple, which is where I met Randy. We worked together at Apple for many years, and uh, I have held just about every job and just done about everything you can imagine in uh, the ed tech space from being a sales manager, marketing manager, sales rep, account manager, business development manager, software evangelist, you name it, and for the last 20 years, I've had my own consulting practice. That's how I got to know Mitch. We uh, worked a lot together uh, collaboratively. We've uh, been involved with professional associations together like the ones Mitch mentioned. My area of channel development and uh, working with channels and uh, helping people uh, promote their products and get engagement and attract the attention of the buyers. Uh, marketing is my particular flair, but I have plenty of experience as a sales manager, sales rep. I totally get it, and I understand the continuum of need from the very first uh, engagement that you might have to make sure somebody knows who you are all the way through the stage of when you might get those people to become raving evangelists for your product. 
So I'm excited about this opportunity. Uh, I want to be helpful and uh, have an attitude of servitude for all of you. I will also point out that the photos on the screen, only Randy and I have greenery behind our heads, which is indicative of us uh, spending time outside where Randy actually works. So I will um, introduce Randy that way and have him come on and tell you about his amazing work uh, operating one of the most successful uh, education channels out there. Randy. Glenn, thank you very much. And um, I do plan to go outside sometime soon. I'm now approaching retirement age, so hopefully uh, that'll, be in my, that'll be in my future. As Glenn shared, he and I both had the opportunity, and I am always characterized as a pleasure to work for Apple. Uh, my background started in the classroom as a teacher, uh, felt the need to get out and to determine whether or not it would be a lifelong commitment to stay in the classroom and go into administration, which had been my original plan. So uh, I embarked on a career in sales. No idea what that meant, but uh, my brother had gone to work for IBM as a salesman, was making uh, good money driving a nice car, and I knew I was at least as smart as my older brother. So. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a job back in 1981 with a company that no longer exists, Control Data Corporation. So you may have heard of Control Data, one of the largest companies in the world, Fortune 500. It had a product at the time called Play-Doh. Some of you probably have heard of Play-Doh. So I actually sold Play-Doh before Play-Doh was a company. Uh, in 84, I had the uh, good sense to accept a call from Apple Computer, which at the time was starting up an education group. And I joined Apple in 1984, eventually became part of the senior management team in the field as a director of uh, operations uh, here in the central US. So for 12 years, I was a part of the team at Apple that I thought really did make some magical things happen. We attracted some incredibly talented people. And I was, had the good fortune of meeting Glenn there and many, many others. Um, in 2003, after doing some other work in and around the space, I decided to address the next which was distribution, sales to education customers, to school districts, and um, try to find products that I believed in as an educator and excited me as someone who believed deeply in the rare opportunity for technology to improve student learning and teacher effectiveness. So I started EdTech Partners, frankly, because Glenn said it would be a good idea. Um, so we're now entering our 14th year. We're a little different than maybe the independent rep that you may know of. Um, my company, we're by and large educators. I hire people. We're not. Uh, uh, kind of the mercenary independent rep from the uh, standpoint that some of you may have experience with. And the role I play is to try to vet and find really exciting technology products that I think have uh, a real place to play in our classrooms in the 21st century. Uh, when Glenn, Mitch asked if I would be interested uh, I responded with a emphatic hell yes, because I do believe that the role that gaming plays in the 21st century is extraordinarily important, and if we can play a small role in helping any of you, we'd be honored to do so. Mitch, that's it. I'm going to okay. go outside now. <laughs> okay, yeah, change your picture to, uh, yeah. to something that's outside. So I, I think a lot of this began with the conversations that I've been having with many of you over the last two or three years, where uh, where we've been discussing how very you know how difficult it is to sell into the education marketplace, how hard it is to make money in, uh, selling education games. Uh, a lot of you have talked about how you know people love your game, but it's but people just aren't buying it, or like you you feel like you're. This is something that I've heard so many times. I feel like I'm hitting my head against the wall. Um, you know, some of you that started off with free games and looking for a transition from free to paid, and that's proven to be a path that's been really, really difficult in the education marketplace. We're going to go through that 
some of the reasons behind that a little bit later. Um, and a lot of you, you know, if you tried conferences, I know some of you, I've seen you at the pavilions that uh, uh, Glenn, geez, now here I thought I had, I had stopped that. Um, okay, I guess it stopped, good. Uh, I've seen that uh, Glenn Larson has, has done at ISTE or FETC or TCA. Some of you have become uh, CETA partners um, but you go to conferences and you don't get sales. And I think I'm going to hand this back over to Glenn. Um, Glenn, maybe you can just talk about this issue a little bit. Absolutely. Um, and I, I presume, Mitch, you're talking about some of the conference-related matters, right? Especially conferences, right. I go to yeah. conferences, but somehow or other I don't get sales. Absolutely. So let me talk a little bit about conferences. And um, if you're interested in hearing more about my tirades about conferences, you can go on sellingtoschools.com, which is my content site, and read plenty of uh, my spouting off about conferences and why they don't work for a lot of people as well as they should. Uh, yet, it is the most predominant method for people to get out there and get in front of educators. That part is good. It is a great way to get in front of educators. The challenge is that frequently it ends up being more like a flea market where people are in an exhibit hall, there's a lot of noise and distraction, and people don't do a real good job of making sure that they get in front of the people who can actually buy things and make decisions. And so it ends up being uh, a situation where you may end up with lots and lots of leads, which you actually think are leads, and they're really not leads at all. They're just names of people who came by the booth, happened to be interested or just walking through, often looking for something free. You know, people give away all kinds of little gadgets and toys and candy and so forth. And so educators are known to actually plow through these exhibit halls with shopping carts and just grab everything they can put their mitts on. And that's really not a very productive environment. So we, are, we have changed, uh, changed the game there. Uh, I have done this throughout my career, but uh, Mitch and I have continued to refine a way to uh, actually get results from conferences and not just walk away with a pile of names that don't really get you any business. So. That's um, something important. But we've also heard, you know, there's, it's, it's tough to sell. Um, and just in general, um, the, the, the challenges are, first of all, just getting the attention of the people who can make the decisions. That perhaps is the greatest challenge. They're super busy, uh, they're distracted, and they're getting hammered by hundreds of people like yourselves and me too who want to get their attention and they've got very limited time to do so. So they build walls around themselves, um, which uh, the typical filters that we all apply, like voicemail and email filters and those kinds of things. But they also have assistants that are executive assistants that are wonderful at keeping people away from them. So they're, they're protecting themselves because they have to value, uh, focus their time against their priorities. And so you really have to know what you're doing in order to get engagements with these folks. And it isn't easy. And um, they, uh, educators also, as you guys probably know, it's on the slide there. Uh, they, love, they love free stuff. They love handouts. I like discounts. And uh, all that has to be managed, too. And there, there is an element of, of uh, finesse to giving them things enough uh, samples and different kinds of pilot programs and those kinds of things to really get them engaged with what you have to offer and make the transition to where they're actually paying for it. And that's, that requires some skills as well that Randy and myself and Mitch have uh, painfully paid the price to learn over many, many years. By the way, that between the three of us, it's got to be close to 100 years of experience, isn't it, Mitch? I mean, it's something crazy. Yep. Uh, we're, all, we're all basically fossils at this point. The only advantage to working with us has nothing to do with our physiques at this point. Uh, it has to do with what we've assembled in our brains is the wisdom and knowledge of how to navigate uh, what can seem like a very dark hole uh, and, or a field filled with landmines and, and to survive. And we have wounds to show for it, and uh, we're happy to be able to save you some pain and suffering. So, Mitch, back to you. Okay. And then, you know, I just wanted to also bring up this point, you know, that we hear a lot. You know, I have reps who are handling my sales, but somehow or other they aren't closing any significant sales. And maybe, Randy, you can talk a little bit about that issue. 
Sure, Mitch, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I have to say I, I chuckled when I filled out the um, webinar information. and There was a quote uh, that Mitch had posted about independent reps are problematic at best. Now, uh, education technology partners, we, we truly do try to be far more than an independent rep. Uh, the word partner is in the company's name for a purpose. But be that as it may, I am the first to admit we can be problematic. I have my days. I have my moods like anyone else, and I'm fiercely independent. I don't work, work for someone else because I wanted to do my own thing. So that mindset uh, is probably central to everyone who's in this business carrying a bag and whether they're uh, the old gumshoe type uh, from the print industry selling textbooks uh, or have evolved into something else, there aren't a lot of people who have a reach that can go beyond, say, a couple of counties or a state. And I recognize, and Glenn was there at the time as well, when Apple tried to develop a sales organization through partnerships, and uh, I was amazed. The, the companies didn't exist. But another perspective on the fact that we're problematic, and that is a kind of a reality that this door swings both ways. I have the same 24 hours in my day as you do. I eat what I kill. If a product isn't selling for me, I really can start. Um, ideally, anyone you deal with who might partner with you on the sales side would sit down and understand what you do and by the same token, explain sort of what's in their portfolio. Um, but if you're not ready for a partner, a channel, sales model, I truly don't want to talk to you because it's a painful process, as Glenn said. Uh, this acquired wisdom uh, does not come without scars. And I have, I have talked to people uh, who have passion, great passion for what they've built. And uh, if they're not ready, if they don't have some idea of the real benefits, not the features, but the benefits of their product, if they haven't invested and built reference accounts, if they don't have a clue about marketing, so Glenn can help you with that, believe me, um, I don't want to have to come in and help you do all of that. Um, so what I like to say is at times, and I hate to be the one who does this, but for those of you who are parents out there, and I have two lovely children, uh, we all believe our baby is the most beautiful child in the world. Though I have to admit, when my son was born, he looked a bit like Mick, Mick Jagger to me, but he's a good-looking kid now. But I, I hate to be the one to say, but I've had to do it, that your baby, your product is ugly. In other words, your dog won't hunt. And uh, at times, that can be the very best thing I can do by leveling with you sharing with you my thoughts and to tell you why you might have a harder battle in finding Mindshare, as Glenn also astutely pointed out, uh, getting through these filters and uh, if I'm able to get in front of the right person in the school district, and believe me, we, we are successful at that, I've got just a handful of seconds and minutes to establish a continued interest. and. We have to be working together and the right materials in place to establish that uh, that sense of value and interest very, very quickly. So, yeah, we can be tough. We can be difficult. But um, understand, too, they may be telling you something, and they may not be as uh, overt in their comments as I've been. But uh, if they're not selling for you, do engage in a conversation and do some self reflection because there might be uh, some more material reasons for that. Yeah, so we're not going to be necessarily easy, uh, but you're not looking, I'm assuming that none of you are really looking for easy. What you're looking for is sales, and that's what 
you know, this whole meeting is about. And, uh, you know, Randy with his track record and Glenn with his track record and me just kind of piggybacking off the, the two of them, uh, hopefully, we'll, you know, we can get you there. I think also, you know, if before we really talk about sales, okay, I, I think as a business owner, uh, you need to think also, what's your business goal? We're all, everybody here is in business. So is your goal to run a sustainable business in order to maintain a certain lifestyle? Is that what, you know, and do a certain amount of good? Is, is that what your goal is for your business? Or are you looking to raise money to scale to become a multi-million dollar business? Or are you looking to, at, at some point or, or soon, sell your business to a larger publisher or a private equity firm? Just, you know, think about that for a moment because, you know, what you want, how you sell, what you want to do is going to be partially dependent on what you want from your business. And I'll also say that those of you, you know, when you have comments, you have questions, if you want to go even to the chat window and just say, I have a question or something like that, um, that'll alert me and I can, you know, you can come up and also talk ask, and ask your question. So it, it, to a certain extent, whether you're looking to run a sustainable business with, or raise money or sell your business to a larger firm, there's a certain proof that you have to give any of these interested parties. It's really difficult to maintain a, uh, to run a sustainable business if you're reaching to you know for your first hundred thousand dollars. You know somewhere between three hundred thousand dollars and a million dollars. Okay, that's a good sustainable business. Somewhere between three hundred thousand and a million dollars, you're able to uh, to talk to professional investors about raising money in order to scale your business. Um, somewhere around, somewhere between three hundred thousand and a million dollars, uh, you've reached a size that's large enough for a publisher or a PE firm to be willing to work with you, and or purchase you. So, to, to a certain extent, it, it all begins with how do you get to that first half million dollars worth of revenue that then gives you real choices that you can make with your business. That's what we're really all about, and that begins with understanding that if you're gonna sell into the K-12 market, sales are driven by the administrators. Administrators control 85% um, of the purchases that are made in education. Again, it's 85%. So if you look at um, MDR's data, which says that the total market for content and software is about $12 billion, the administrators control about $10.2 billion out of that $12 billion. So if you, want to, if you want to reach critical mass, that's the group to go after. Now, teachers love games, but teachers don't buy. Okay, teachers, the average teacher in the U.S. has a budget of $50 a year. And then the average teacher pays out of her own pocket somewhere between $400 and $500 a year. Now, that doesn't just go for content. That goes for pencils, pens, erasers, uh, anything that the teacher buys that's $50 in budget and another $400 to $500 of her own money to spend. Now, we've done surveys and the Gates Foundation did a survey and they found that administrators love games, but, they're, but they said that their biggest obstacle to purchasing games is that they don't have the time to evaluate individual games. They, they can't expend the effort or time to find and evaluate the, the, the individual games. And it's also shown that teachers are not an effective entry point to administrative purchasing decisions. So. Um, so the idea of, hey, we're going to get a lot of teachers interested in us, and then they're going to go to the administrators, and the administrators are going to buy something, that, that, just, that model has not yet worked effectively in education. So really, from the very beginning, we're saying, let's target the administrators, and let's come up with something that really meets their needs so that we can, we can sell to them. 
but it's not so easy. And I'm going to hand this back over to Glenn to talk about uh, to talk about you know selling to administrators. Yeah, Mitch, that looks a little like my twin brother there. Um, uh, people have said that to me. I think Randy, you've t pointed that out uh, that I look like Gene Wilder, but um, hopefully uh, maybe not quite that crazy. Um, I'd love to have a purple coat like that, though, Mitch. Maybe you can get me one. So why is it so hard to sell to administrators? I think, you know, going back to the point that I made a few minutes ago, and Randy kind of reiterated that, I think some of it is just access. Um, if you think about the fact that there's approximately, depending on who you talk to, 20,000 school districts, that, and there's one person in charge, um, you know, in the case of the kind of things we want to sell, it might be the curriculum director, uh, but you're talking about a very, very tiny number of people that are controlling an enormous amount of money uh, in terms of purchasing, as Mitch pointed out. So you can imagine with that few people controlling that much purchasing power, everybody wants to get to that person and therefore it becomes a real challenge for that person to manage all of that and make some sense of it. So the first thing is just getting access to the person. Um, and then uh, the other challenges are related to how do you articulate uh, how what you have to offer is really going to meet their needs. And often the presentations that I've seen, perhaps some of them that you've heard yourself, and I'm sure that Randy could attest to this, a lot of times the uh, information that's provided is feature oriented and it may have absolutely nothing to do with the kind of problems or the needs that the administrators have and the, there's just not enough work done uh, to really explain specifically what problem this is going to solve and particularly make it resonate with the people who are on the receiving end of the message. So once you get through to administrator, which is perhaps the biggest challenge, you've probably got a few minutes. Um, uh, the old idea of an elevator pitch uh, could never be more relevant because you've got very, very limited time to say something compelling enough to get to the next step. And you really have to have a strong value proposition. So over many years of trial and error and some good coaching and some amazing mentors, I've got that piece to where I feel like I'm pretty competent at it. I'm sure Mitch and Randy could attest to that. Um, and so it's kind of that messaging and then it's certainly the uh, access and then uh, really understanding what are their objections going to be um, because that's the key to selling and Randy can attest to this probably better than anybody. If you can't answer objections effectively, uh, they'll shut you down really fast. And there's a whole bunch of them you can anticipate, like we don't have any money, which is sort of the standard one, um, or we don't have any money for this, or we don't have it in the budget now. Those are sort of the classic ones, but there's a whole laundry list of sort of classic objections. You really need to understand what those are, and you need to be ready to answer them. So there's a whole range of reasons why um, selling to administrators is challenging. And um, that's why we uh, are talking to you guys, because we have, I wouldn't say we've necessarily cracked the code, that's probably a bit of a leap, but I think uh, you're probably on the receiving end of three people who probably know as much about it as anybody else and have had certainly all the experiences to know how to manage this. So Mitch, back over to you, or maybe to Randy for a little fill-in. Yeah, Randy, why don't, uh, why don't you weigh in? Yeah, thank you. Glenn, I, I did. I want to touch on something you said, and uh, by no means do I possess all the knowledge to uh, success in this in this industry that we've elected to uh, subject ourselves to. But in my humble opinion, the number one reason that your product will not be successful if you gain entree to that decision making is because you have not thought through how the classroom teacher is going to effectively use that program, use your tool, use your app in his or her classroom, and that you have a way, and you've thought this through, to train, 
the professional development side, and I know some of you, you may not have given this any thought whatsoever, but you need to look at your product, your child, and have a solution that thinks through how the building principal can feel confident that if they spend this money, the teachers will use it, they'll know how to use it, they'll be encouraged to use it, that hopefully the building principal will know that the teachers have used it. And by that, being, by that you've got some kind of a management uh, system. Uh, if you can bring those elements together, and I know that's a mouthful, but Glenn, in my humble opinion, that's where nine times out of 10, it breaks down. I can't yeah, agree I think, more, Randy, and by the way, that's certainly one of those objections that I talked about, probably one of the first one that comes up. There's say, after they say we don't have any money, it's like, well, and besides, how are we supposed to use this in our classrooms? Can you tell me that too? So I agree with you totally, Randy. Yeah, I think all of the, all the administrators that, that we talk to, I mean, they've seen so many can't fail, ed tech products fail, that they're a little bit jaundiced. And they want they want to know that if they're looking at something that it's uh, it's a solution to a problem that they have and not um, you know n not a week of third grade but something that uh, if they're going to talk to a, a salesperson or a vendor they want to know that they're approaching something that's multi grade multi class multi month that fits into what they do and fits in, and and fits into the way their teachers teach. So then the question is, is, is sales representation the answer? And obviously, you know, looking at, at sales representation, there's, there's two big options. One is you can do it yourself. You can hire salespeople. Um, and two is you can go to use an outside sale force, whether they're independent reps or a bar. And, it, you know, it's, it's so attractive going to the outside sales force because it's, it's a lower capital requirement to building a sales force, um, lower upfront costs, and there's an expectation that they already have uh, contacts who will buy from them. And so, Randy, you know, again, let me turn this back over to you since this, this really is, I mean, that's, that actually is your picture on the left, isn't it? Um, Fortunately, it's not. <laughs> Folks, again, I, I really don't possess the knowledge to answer this effectively for each and every one of you. But it, in my mind, as, as Mitch points out, it is sort of a binary situation you'll find yourself in. Do I do this myself and take on the burden of payroll and resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or do I outsource it? And God knows if I outsource it, who in the hell am I doing business with? Is it one of these three characters on the slide that Mitch put together? Um, do they have a track record? What else do they do? Why do they do it? Can you trust them? Um, you know, we, we are a odd lot that are out here doing what I do on the sales side. I do it because of my love for and passion for bringing great technology solutions to uh, the classroom. I am a teacher by, by training, but I will be the first to tell you, I really don't want to talk to a teacher. I say that off the record, but I love teachers. I used to be one, but uh, I, it's a decision maker that I want to, uh, to talk to. And remember, I don't make a widget. I don't make anything. So I'm no better than the products I have also associated my name with. Uh, now, at EdTech Partners, we do have a very strong belief of providing the professional development. We've got a whole group that, of trainers who train on our behalf, uh, on the product partners' behalf as well. But um, if you go dir direct and do it yourself, uh, Glenn and I were talking with Mitch yesterday about, you know, telesales and inside sales could very well be the approach, but there are limitations, hard limitations with that approach. And ultimately, I believe, I think Glenn Mitch would agree, you also need feet on the street. You need to look the superintendent in the eye. And uh, the channel can be a very effective partner in that regard. 
Um, Mitch, I'm not sure how much more I can say other than to say to all of you, if you go this route, good luck, <laughs> because uh, there's quite a, quite a cast of characters out there uh, who I've seen come and go over the years. There are some outstanding ones, though. There really are some very good folks. But you keep in mind, uh, they have a portfolio of products. I mean, I, my commitment to any of you, if I was to pick up your product, is um, I will give it appropriate time. If I have too many, I can't give appropriate time. I sure as heck would never carry something that would compete with another product I have. I mean, there's just, there are some ethics, believe it or not, uh, in my mind, in, the, uh, in this role that we play on the sales side. And with luck, you'll find those folks as well. Yeah, the, the good uh, representation that's out there, very often, you know, they already have a lot of products. Um, I'm sure, you know, Randy, I, I mean, we talked earlier, I mean, you already have a lot of products that, that you represent. And, you know, you, the, the, the salespeople are going to push the products that are going to earn them the most. And if it's an unknown product, that's a product that's going to re require more effort. And so as an unknown product or as an unknown group of products, what, what we're all looking to do is we have to generate enough leads to make it worth the salesperson's time in order to sell. And that, you know, that's one of the big goals of, you know, of, of this cooperative. So, uh, Glenn, do you have thoughts on this or should I move on? Well, once again, I'd encourage people to dive into a thought flow from me that's gone on for about 10 years. A lot of that's documented on sellingtoschools.com or my talk radio program of the same name. I have a lot to say about independent reps. I've been up and down and sideways with many independent reps, and uh, Randy, I think, said it very well. Um, it sounds like a, a free lunch in a way, um, but believe me, it's not. And I always remind people the really good ones are fully occupied, and you're going to have to convince them to take something out of their bag to put yours in there. So um, they're very selective. And they have a right to be if they're really good at it. If they're if they're looking for more products and they're not busy, that's a bit of a yellow flag. So, um, I everything Randy said is is bang on. And uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite topics. So rather than rattle on here, Mitch, um, I'll encourage people to dive into the archives on SellingToSchools.com. There's tons there. Some of it I think you contributed, Mitch, yep. and you, Randy, too, and Randy too. So yeah. There's a lot, lot out there you can read about that from us. Thanks. Let me, let me throw one other thing out there that uh, uh, just, just to give you a perspective. Uh, on one hand, I used to believe that we existed to be fired, that I knew realistically uh, a company, once we got them established, was going to take their sales inside and I was going to lose that product. Um, as things have evolved and I have grown very – close to the products we represent and have a strong feeling for them. Um, in two cases, the companies, we actually now have a bit of an equity opportunity so that we won't build and then see the ship sail off while we, while we are standing on the dock. Um, we will now be on the boat and enjoying the fruits of our mutual labor. I have no issues whatsoever saying to anyone that I talk to that I am an unabashed and unapologetic capitalist. I love education. I love children. I have a couple of my own. But I'm in this for the money. And uh, ideally, your success will be our success, and we will be on this journey together. So the evolution that I have tried to encourage is whenever I talk to a potential product partner and they are looking at channel sales is to encourage them to, to come up with a way that a good reseller could continue and be part of the DNA going forward and it wouldn't be an all or nothing sort of a situation. And it's really that um, I, I'm in it for the money, which is what you want in sales, because sales is hard. So what we're, what we're really proposing is that by combining forces and putting professional sales and marketing management together, 
we can you know we can share the efforts and expenses of selling share the efforts and expenses of marketing share the efforts and expenses of support and implementation in order to grow something that none of us could do individually and that's that's our pro proposal to you and at the same time by combining these needs we can better meet the needs of administrators as well as meeting you know, the needs of us as individual companies. Because by offering a group of games rather than one individual games game, the, the administrator doesn't have to say, oh, you know, like, I, have to, I have to find this game, I have to find this game. The administrator is look, it can say, I'm dealing with one person, I'm getting one invoice, I have one group to turn to for support, one person to pay, one organization to pay, um, we can educate, you know, we can, we can learn about game-based learning from this group. We can get our training and support from this group. All my needs are covered in one place that makes my decision easier. So by combining forces, we're not only are we making ourselves stronger, we're making it a lot easier for the administrators to make decisions. Glenn, do you have a thought here as well? Yeah, I mean, it, it makes perfect sense to pull our resources. Um, I, th I think that one of the big challenges for all companies in our industry, even the biggest players, is scalability. And that's exactly why you've seen consolidation even at the top. So companies like Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, McGraw-Hill, over our careers, I'm speaking about Mitch and Randy and I, uh, there's been a huge buying spree uh, of acquisitions. And again, it's for largely the same reasons is that you can scale up uh, a lot of these operations and eliminate costs that are redundant within these, uh, within these products. And so the big product lines that you have, if you look back, you know, 20 years or so, what you'll find is multiple brands that have been consolidated in sort of a new giant brand new co kind of thing created we're we're kind of thinking in the same way you know everyone out there who's listening has a, a product that they've invested in that they believe in and yet um going to market with that um there are common costs and expenses shared by all of us and by combining forces we can scale something up that makes a whole lot more sense so this is really about getting to scale and um, I think it, from the view of the administrators, it's sort of the same thing. They can't deal with the one-offs. That's why they like the fact that they can go to Pearson and get everything that you can imagine or, or HMH or McGraw. Um, and they, it's sort of one-stop shopping. Uh, but those big companies, as you know, are not really in the gaming business. So we're not pretending we're going to be the size of HMH or McGraw but some of the practices that they've employed in the scalability models work for the administrators and they will work for you as well. Let me also just add, uh, if I may mention, and Glenn, for those of you listening, participating today, um, you also will enhance the uh, esteem of your products in the eyes of a distributor, of a of a of a dis, of an independent rep, if your if the price point that we're taking to market is going to generate five and six figure purchase orders, if you ask me to sell a product which costs two dollars a student, a dollar ninety eight, I really am not interested. Uh, it's there is just an economic target that I must have and. By amalgamating those of you who go forward, I think this brings value, uh, significant value to you in terms of the ability to find the right kind of distribution partner, sales partner going forward. Right. If a school administrator um, were to purchase, a, you know, for let's say an average of two dollars a student, but three games per student. And of course, no game is going to meet the needs of every student. I mean, you're talking, you, the average school is about 700 students. So you're really talking about a $4,500 um, order, which is, which is something that's more reasonable for a school administrator to look at. 
or if it's for multiple schools, you, you start talking about ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar order, which is much more reasonable for a district administrator to look at. Um, and you, you can't get there by saying, well, I used to charge two dollars for my game, but in order to get that, I'm going to charge fifteen dollars per student for my game. You get that by by pulling together and and by having a basket of thirty or forty games that the school can can choose from. Uh, for a variety of topics and a variety of ages in order to make that uh, decision-making spot, uh, to hit the sweet spot of a, a school or a district decision maker. So the question is, is why us? And, and it's, it's funny because Randy and um, Glenn and I were talking a little bit earlier. And, uh, you know, between us, we've got about 100 years of experience in education, sales, and marketing. It's, it's kind of scary. Um, and through that experience, we have a lot of lead generation connections. We talked a little bit earlier about, you know, associations and conferences. Just, you know, share a little bit about what uh, Glenn and I did, have, have done, really, for, for companies. Uh, last year, we were at FETC with, with a client. And, it was, and we used the, the type of sponsorship that an individual game company couldn't, real, probably couldn't do, which is like a twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 sponsorship in order to be able to meet with only decision makers individually. And so through that type of sponsorship, we're able to get access to the email list and send out a special invitation to a special, to a series of special events for the decision makers. And on the basis of that, we were able to get 50 reasonably substantial orders for this one customer. Um, and those were just the first orders that they got, and then there's the renewals and the expansion of the orders to existing to, to additional schools. Um, I know a couple of you. I've, I've met you at, at CETA, and you've you've been in the innovators group, and the innovators group gives you a little bit of access to the state of tech directors. But you know, when when we were um, when we introduce a company to CETA, we introduce them at a higher level of sponsorship, which again is beyond what an individual game company can do. But through those sponsorships, you get to meet individually with the state ed tech directors who then steer you to the districts who are most likely to use the products and will make introductions for you. And that's the type of connections that we can get through our group being together. Um, you know, in addition to just, you know, people will think of us as the game-based learning group because that's what, that's what our whole focus will be. Um, uh, Glenn, do you want to talk a little bit about this as well? Yeah, thanks, Mitch. Uh, yeah, I just want to maybe reflect back on um, some of the activities that we, that Mitch and I have worked on over the past couple of years with clients and <clears throat> really it's an evolution of my interest and work in direct marketing and understanding about how you really engage with decision makers, what you can uh, say to them and what you can put in front of them that really is compelling so that they'll prioritize their schedule. These people are super busy and you have to be able to put something together that really intrigues them and position it in a way that it doesn't sound like they're going to get a sales pitch or something like that. So we've got a, um, a method uh, that we believe, uh, based on results we've had uh, at uh, several conferences over the past couple of years, that is quite scalable, and we um, are confident that that kind of a strategy is very effective when coupled with other kinds of proven methods around content marketing and, and other, uh, you know, well thought through uh, ways of engaging the audience, getting the message across, and getting through and above the noise that they are working with. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, I think our, our record is, is really solid, and um, I think you'd find that um, we've got this as well figured out as anybody else. Again, I'm not pretending that it isn't challenging and that we are perfect and we get everything right. That would be baloney. But yeah. I don't think you'll find more dedicated, knowledgeable people to work with. So then the question is, so, so what are we asking of you? Uh, and uh, what we're really looking for is a $20,000 initial investment in in joining the group and we're hoping to get eventually about 20 people but we're going to limit it to eight initially 
Um, so twenty thousand dollars per developer, and we'll and that will cover um, an awful lot. We'll go through some of the ones that, that we're envisioning. An awful lot of the lead generation and management activities that we'll have moving forward, and then on sales. 40% uh, go to the developers, 60% go to sales and marketing. Um, and then what we expect to return over a four-year period is about to generate about $40 million of sales over the course of four years. That's, that's growing, of which you take 40% of that, $16 million goes to developers, which turns out to, if there were if there are 20 developers joining, which then turns out to be about $800,000 per developer. And the way we, we you know, just to, ch to check the reasonableness of the, um, of getting the, you know, $40 million over three years, um, there's about $80,000, 80,000 schools in the U.S. with an average of 700, 700 students per school. And we took a look at that and says, well, look, you know, even if, you know, if the average game went for about $2 per student, and if we can reach about 10% of the schools selling about three games for each student at each school, that gets us to about $35 million of sales. Uh, we think that there's a decent chance that we can reach that over five to six years. So over the first four years, getting for a cumulative sales level of, of $40 million doesn't seem unreasonable. And then you back that down to the school purchase. And that turns out to be a school purchase price of $4,200 per school, which is well within the principal's ability to purchase without asking for further approval. So it just seemed, you know, in, in looking at the numbers, that this is something that we could reach if we managed the process correctly, if we did the appropriate type of lead generation activities, and we just sold the heck out of a whole basket of games. So, Randy or Glenn, do you have comments? Well, obviously, um, I imagine you're all looking at those numbers and wondering, well, where the heck did you come up with that? Well, you know, um, having been in the sales business, and Randy, I know you can speak to this, having personally been in the sales business for many years uh, and on the hook either to generate sales forecasts or live up to them from a sales rep perspective, um, and doing these kinds of projections, you know, there's a bit of a triangulation of dart throw and uh, calculations and just frankly good old uh, spirit here on the screen. Uh, these are not numbers that I would take to the bank per se. They're things that we think are reasonable based on our experience of late and our long-term experience in the marketplace. Um, these are not things that you should write down and say, oh, so you're telling me I'll give you 20K now and I'll get that, you'll write me a check for 800K next year. No, that's not exactly what we're saying, but we're saying that it, that's the, we believe that's kind of an opportunity sizing that we can do. Obviously, what unfolds if we actually knew that, we wouldn't be on this call because we'd all be retired as being clairvoyants. But we're not. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't have magic formulas. And any of you who've ever done sales forecasting know that it's sort of an art and a science, but there's a lot of hocus pocus as well. So we think that this is a reasonable presentation of what that looks like. And we're happy to uh, discuss that with you if, if you'd like to dive into that more. Randy, any comments from you? Well, yeah, what, uh, just to echo and reinforce the reasonableness, as Glenn mentioned here, uh, I can tell you as the salesperson of, on the call that a $4,200 purchase order from a school building and multiple purchase orders of that size becomes a very attractive business proposition <laughs> to a sales partner. Uh, Mitch is, as always, spot on, uh, and it, this can vary state to state, but uh, anywhere between five and $10,000 is the threshold that um, could trigger the need for board approval. So uh, if you're at $4,200, what I'm hearing, if you were having this conversation with me, is that there's an ease of doing business with this approach. That's a good thing, believe me. If, if I have to write a proposal, uh, and I've written 100-page proposals, 
for some products, uh, I'm not nearly as interested if I, if we know going in that we have a reasonable likelihood of walking out of a school building with a $4,200 order. Um, and I think the projections in terms of penetration, as Glenn puts, over time certainly is valid. Folks, what I'm trying to say as the outside third-party salesperson that you may be recruiting is simply, this gets my attention. I'm interested in this. It passes a certain sniff test, as I like to say, and um, this could be realistic down the road for the folks that participate. And we, you know, what our goal in this meeting is to trigger you all to then contact well, I mean, we'd love to if, if after this meeting we you'd write a check, but is to but it's really for you to contact me or 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 I'll contact you for a further discussion to get this moving. And you know, looking at the time frame, uh, we're hoping to have uh, up to eight charter members apply uh, to become part of this group by February second and by mid-February to, to go through the process of approving them. Because a, a, a product has to fit in, it has to be, the products have to be ready for prime time and the companies have to be ready for prime time. And we'll go through that uh, really in the next slide. Um, April 3rd, we've had discussions with the Consortium on School Networking. Uh, Glenn and I have had a lot of um, success with the, at the COSIN conference where we meet with district decision makers and walking away with 10, 20, 30 orders from those decision makers directly from the conference. Um, April to May to involve uh, lead gen through, uh, pro primarily through uh, telesales calls. Um, June 23rd to meet with the CETA state leaders. Also in that time frame, probably do something with the there's a joint conference of uh, elementary school and secondary school principals going on about that same time uh, to work with that group. August to September, doing content marketing to generate leads. November to start working with the AESA, uh, which allows us to then partner with the ed service agencies and the different states. And then in, we've already talked to the people from FETC on creating a special games track and um, and games area within FETC to feature uh, the products who are partners of, uh, of this consortium. So those are kind of the, that's a, a layout of, of what we think that the timing is going to be for how we're gonna lay this out in order to drive sales really starting this spring. And you all are probably aware of the, you know, one of the difficulties with the education marketplace is that in order for a sale to be on budget, the decision-making time for that is really the January to March timeframe, and that's just done once a year, every year. Um, that's, you know, we have to generate enough really good qualified leads so, and, and some, you know, some smaller sales, so in that time frame, you know, we're in, and we can blast out the sales for the uh, 2017 to 18 school year. Uh, Glenn, thoughts? Comments? Yeah, the timing is always a question. Um, this probably looks like a, an aggressive timeline, and, and it is. Um, <clears throat> but we have to move fast to seize opportunities. We don't control the dates for these conferences. And as you guys know, one of the, I wouldn't call it a landmine, but one of the, maybe it's a La Brea Tar Pit type of thing, which about the education market is, you have to work on their schedule. You know, it, it is not forgiving. Uh, the academic calendar, the buying cycle and all that is uh, rather predictable and rather unforgiving. So you have to conform your activities accordingly. Uh, we're having this conversation at a time when obviously things are in high gear in terms of decisions being made, budgets being mapped out and all that stuff. So we think this is the time to get in front of people, hence the uh, urgency that we've uh, expressed uh, here about really getting everything going so that we can uh, make a splash at COSIN, which is an important meeting if 
if you've never been to that meeting, uh, it's probably the largest meeting of technology officers in the U.S., um, several hundred senior level uh, decision makers at the district level who are responsible for a lot of the technology decisions and certainly influencing decisions overall increasingly. So very important stuff, Mitch. Uh, <clears throat> so if, by the way, if your phone is ringing, can you um, uh, silence your mic? So, you know, we, we also alluded to the fact that this isn't necessarily for, you know, for every game or every game company. The game and the game company has to be ready for prime time. So we, we've come up with a, uh, a rubric for how we're going to go through <clears throat> and uh, evaluate the, the games and the companies. Um, obviously, the product has to work. Uh, the interface, the, uh, the user experience has to be professional and appropriate. Uh, I know many of you have had SBIR grants, um, so there has to be documented evidence of learning and student engagement. I'm, you know, I'm sure you all have some, um, some documentation about that. Uh, for the decision makers, they're going to be looking for curriculum and lesson plans, so something to indicate what the students are going to learn, how the, what the students should do before using the game, what the teacher should, how the teacher should integrate the game into her classroom, what should, what should she do afterwards, and how she should assess student progress. Uh, there should be tutorials for teachers. Um, it needs to teach something. It can't just be a, a game for, I mean, it has to be fun and engaging, but it has to teach, uh, and certainly alignment to standards, whether they're ELA standards or math standards or next generation science standards or social studies standards, alignment to standards is a definite plus. And the company has to be channel ready, and I'm going to turn back over to Randy um, for that. Uh, Randy, can you add um, your two and a half cents? Are you there, or are you muted? Sorry about that. Um, some random thoughts. How you do business with a partner will involve a contract. Um, how money flows. Uh, there are legal aspects of doing business with us, and I would suggest to you uh, that you want to pay attention to these details before they become a problem. So you need to be ready from a standpoint of the contractual legal aspects. Um, how we amplify your story is going to be no better than how prepared you are and what tools you have to help us do that. Do you have success stories? Do you have a PowerPoint deck that lends itself to a 20, 30 minute webinar with the 10, 15 minutes of Q&A, so in 45 minutes, I can effectively deliver a one-on-many webinar and establish some interest. I can go on and on and on about the component pieces on the marketing side. I can absolutely assure you there's nobody better in my mind in this industry than Glenn McCandless, uh, but if you, if you haven't already thought about aspects of how you want me to address your product, what, what the elevator pitch is. You need to help me with that. I could come up with something. You may hate it. Let's think all of these things through before you're ready to then have someone else act as your representative. And we have a questionnaire, which uh, it, it's pretty, it's almost completed already, uh, which we will go through with you uh, to outline both the bullet points here and in greater detail channel readiness. Are, you know, are, is your game ready to sell and, and do we have the right messaging behind it um, and are we doing it right? So, um, I know, Randy, I'm sorry, uh, Glenn, do you have a, a comment here? Sorry about that, I was on mute. Okay. Uh, no, I think uh, ju just, again, reflecting back on this idea of channel readiness, 
what does that really mean? I think there's multiple dimensions to that, and I often say to people, your choice of go-to-market strategy, some of that has to do with your own personalities and you know whether you want, how tightly you want to control uh, your business. Um, are you comfortable working with third parties? Have you had successful partnerships? Sometimes I ask people if they've been successfully married because I think that may be the ultimate partnership that that we all can struggle with. So um, ultimately, channel readiness is about sort of partner readiness, as Randy alluded to. It's not a transaction, folks. It's really a relationship, and it's a partnership. And like all partnerships, it has to be win-win. There's sort of stuff that has to be done on both sides. Randy just alluded to some of the more tactical things that you might need. And we've got kind of a checklist of requirements that we think are important that would give us a good idea of whether the partnership will be successful from a business standpoint. And then obviously we want to make sure that we believe your product is ready to go to market and will achieve the kind of success that you're really looking for. We don't want to be, as Randy said, representing something that we're not totally confident in as well. Okay, so so Martha asked a question, and let me just um, go back to, uh, you know, I guess this slide here. She asked, so what's this twenty thousand dollars going to? Um, and let's, so I'm trying to to find the right slide here, but I guess this is this is probably as good as any to start with. The lead generation activities that we're going to be doing. Are, these are really beyond what a certainly a startup would do. So let's you know. So for example, at Cosin, uh, one could theoretically, uh, for something like seven or eight thousand dollars, become a sponsor at Cosin and and have a table at a booth. But what but what we're going to be doing at Cosin is we'll get a preview of their. Uh, it's a special type of sponsorship where because they, they trust us, they give us a preview of uh, the people who are coming. We go through that and select who we believe are the decision makers. We then, have, uh, we then send out to them, partially under COSIN's name, an invitation to a special event around game-based learning or a series of special breakfasts around game-based learning. Uh, those decision makers then come and we present them and, and get their opinion on, you know, these are the things that game-based learning is good for, uh, these are how other districts are using it, here are some games that we think are going to be applicable to your district, which of course are the games uh, who, are, who are members in this consortium, um, and would you be willing to, uh, to recommend some schools in your districts, or would you be able to purchase these games for schools in your districts uh, now or at a subsequent meeting. Now, that type of sponsorship, you know, all told, when you consider the sponsorship, the, the, the event, um, the travel and everything, that type of sponsorship is about 30, it turns out to be, costs about $30,000. Um, similar with CETA, you know, this, the, um, the entry level sponsorship of CETA is around six or $7,000. But to really get individual meetings with the state leaders is a fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars sponsorship, and when you throw in the cost of doing an event with those leaders, um, you know it's it's uh, larger. You know it's, it, it again turns out to be the twenty thirty thousand dollar level of of expense. So um, so yes, you know these. The bulk of that twenty thousand dollars is going towards activities that we've done in the past um, that are more expensive and larger than what an individual company generally does, but things that we've done with with much larger companies that have shown success um, in getting the attention of decision makers um, and holding their interest. Uh, so I hope that mentions their. Uh, that um, that answers your your question. And uh, again, what I what I really like to do, uh, what we really like to do, is to meet with you, you know, individually after this, also, and and we can go into some greater detail. Um, should also mention that you know that you know we, yes, you know we we are looking for um, you know the twenty thousand uh, dollars, but 
if we go through the vetting process and you're, you know, and you're not ready, we're going to return seventeen thousand dollars of that twenty thousand dollars. You know, that'll you know, we're not, you know, there's a certain amount of effort we have to do to fully vet, vet your organization, but you know, th that twenty thousand dollars isn't where we're looking to um, make our money. We're looking to make our money over the course of five years, six years, working with you and expanding the business. We're using that twenty thousand dollars to, you know, partially vet the company, and most of it used for uh, for lead generation activities and market development activities in order to increase the stature of game based learning and increase the sales of your games. So, um, other questions from people? We'd, we'd love we'd love to hear some more questions. Um, and basically, what we're looking for is is up to eight members. Uh, by February 2nd, what this will entail from you is to undergo the process of vetting and then probably four to six meetings in order to help get you set up over the next three to five months um, so that we're, we're, um, we're selling effectively. Uh, Glenn, comments? No, I don't have any specific comments, just uh, maybe again to uh, just reiterate on you know what we do with the money. I mean, some of that this is formative and relates to uh, the members that we have and making sure that we match our activities to the needs of the members who ultimately are involved in the program. So our initial thinking is around a range of proven strategies to generate leads, which would then be ready to be turned over to the sales team. Uh, for, to be closed and, and get those transactions done. So it, it's really the upfront is, as you would expect, given the time of year because of the decision-making process in the schools, it has to really focus on generating demand, building awareness, getting the message out. Uh, that's a Q1 and, you know, sort of through April type of thing. And as, as you get closer to the end of the academic year, which is the budget year, uh, then that kind of activity doesn't make as much sense because you've sort of passed the opportunity. So there's a front end load on lead generation and building demand and getting, you know, awareness of brand product and all that sort of thing uh, so that we can uh, hopefully drive some actual transactions based on this year's budget, but also the budgets that will come available in July. Okay, uh, Randy, any, any closing uh, I thoughts? I don't know that I have anything more to say. Uh, truthfully, ladies and gentlemen, when I mentioned uh, Glenn asked me to participate, I said I, my goal was to say as little as possible, uh, to kind of uh, hear what you're hearing. Um, we have had the questions, and Martha, your question was my question. Uh, it's a very good question in my mind. And after hearing their response to it, I became all the more excited about the potential of this group doing great things for those of you who elect to uh, participate in an hour down the road. Um, I think they're, they're tr doing all the right things to shorten the time from uh, launch to significant revenue generation as a group could do for someone starting into this business. So, here's, so Monica asks, will the slide desk and recording be available after this meeting? I need, um, so, uh, so <laughs> um, we, I'll, we'll make the slide deck available. Um, the, uh, the recording, uh, I, I, I did put the recording on, and I, I will try to make the court recording available. I will say that for the first X minutes, whatever, I don't know if it was five minutes or seven minutes, I forgot to record. So the very uh, beginning of the recording will not be available. Um, but, you know, I'll be happy to, you know, to talk to any of us probably would be happy, but probably I'm the best contact, uh, to talk to any of you individually and, you know, do a quick recap um, or explore your situation uh, more specifically. So hope that um, hope, hope that answers your question. Um, okay. 
so, um, so, you know, I, assuming that there aren't any other questions, I mean, we booked this for, um, you know, I thought, it, I was thinking that this would last an hour, so we booked 90 minutes to be sure. We've gone almost 20 minutes over the hour, uh, but we're, we're, we're shorter than 90 minutes, which is good. Um, any, um, any other questions from other people? Um, uh, and if not, then uh, we'll be, you know, hopefully you'll be in touch with us. Uh, if not, uh, we'll send you just a, a, a quick email to ask if you're interested or, or have any other questions uh, and that we, we can talk and hopefully we can get this launched in the next few weeks and, uh, and start selling a lot of games into a lot of schools. So, uh, you know, Randy, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, you know, um, you, you were great. Uh, Glenn, um, thank you. you. You weren't quite as great as great Randy, but, um, uh, that's, but, you That's know, a big thing to live up to, Mitch. I know, um, I know. But you, great, but you were grateful good. To, grateful to be here with you, Mitch. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work with both of you, and uh, I'd be delighted to talk with uh, and would look forward to meeting with anyone who was part of this call today. Okay, so um, so we might as well like we might as well end this meeting, and uh, hope to talk to you all soon. Uh, in hope hoping you all have an incredible 2017, and hoping that we can do it together. So uh, thank you, Mitch. Thank you all. Okay. Good luck, everyone. Yeah.